It wasn't about courage to do anything. It wasn't about, really at that point, it wasn't about denial. It was about desperation. I learned that I was not good enough, that I would never be good enough, that I couldn't do anything uh, well or right. And it just really affected my whole desperation. 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 I'm Miles. I'm a house manager. I'm a father, I'm a farmer, and I'm a recovering addict. Growing up, I grew up, uh, grew up on a farm, and um, one memory is, you know, milking Bessie the cow. Dad gave me a bucket and a stool and put me down in front of Bessie, and I would milk, and my dad could always make a lot of foam, so I was like, you know, six years old, my hands weren't that strong, but I really worked hard and strived to make a lot of foam. I look back now and I think those were things that just really sort of sustained me throughout my childhood uh, and gave me a, a belief, a foundation for a belief system that I can go back to today and really appreciate uh, those times and, and know that I was connected and didn't really know I was connected to something greater than myself, but uh, it was just, you know, that was some good memories, but there was also some hard times too with that. Early in life, uh, my dad's brother did a lot of humiliating things to me in front of people and made me feel really less than, um, that I wasn't, uh, it was just embarrassing and humiliating. And later, my dad's mother, my grandmother told me that I would never amount to anything that no hunter ever had. And so that really took root and just really solidified the, the belief system that I learned that I was not good enough, that I would never be good enough, that I couldn't do anything uh, well or right. And it just really affected my whole life. My first time I drank anything, I didn't, it was just more or less to calm my nerves. And you know, but that was sort of, that was sort of the beginning of using to change a feeling that I didn't want to feel. As time progressed on throughout my life, and it became uh, those times where I would take bottles to the bedroom, hide them, start hiding them. I thought we may have a problem, but I was in such denial. I thought everything I had everything under control that nothing, you know would bother me. And as time progressed, I lost my dad. He passed away uh, in 2005, and uh, my mother passed away in 2010, and I was completely devastated. Um, so that was probably the most challenging time of my life. Just to, to change that feeling and feeling that loss uh, and feeling that void, I just chose substances. I was a disaster. I mean, I was, I, I just have so many blank memories of just stuff because I was so messed up uh, during that time and after her death. My son is, he's a great, great guy. He's, uh, he's 16 and a half now and he's driving and he's uh, just a really cool kid. I adopted him when he was three and a half years old. I put him through so much hell in my active addiction. Uh, he saw things that a child shouldn't see. One time I was in a fit of rage. I was throwing things and everything and he was trying to get me to stop uh, drinking and I grabbed a butcher knife and put it up to my neck right in front of him and I was like, do you want me to really stop? And my son was screaming to not do it and he finally grabbed the butcher knife out of my hand. And those are moments that, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just what the disease will do to you. It just overtakes you. It wants to destroy you and destroy your family. And that's what it was trying to do to us. My life just became, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And it got to the point where I couldn't function at all. I mean, you know, I had to have something in my body at all times to be able to function. 
to do anything. I mean, it would start, you know, as soon as I would wake up, you know, I was drinking, drinking on the job, drinking everywhere, drinking on the way to work, on the way wherever. And someone had reached out to me and um, said I needed some help. And uh, the next thing I knew, there was an ambulance at my door and they took me to the hospital. From the hospital, they put me in a mental institution. And at that point, they, there was no place for my son to go. So they took my son and put him in state custody. And when I got out of the mental hospital, it was just full on. I was just like, felt hopeless. I felt like there was nothing left. My son was gone. And I knew at that moment that you know, it's like if I don't do something different, I'm never going to get him back. Someone called, it was my son's case manager actually, and she said, Mr. Hunter, it sounds like you need some help. And again, someone showed up at my door, and within just a few days, I was in treatment. I was at a point of desperation that I could not live in my body anymore. I couldn't live within myself. I just, I couldn't take it. You know, and I was so desperate for change that when I came uh, into treatment and came into the, uh, the program, the fellowship that I am in now, it was like whatever they told me to do, I would do it. Whatever suggestions they gave me because I needed to change. I wanted to change. I was desperate. And I'm grateful for the gift of desperation today because that's what brought me here. This is my friend Baker, and uh, I met Baker early on in my recovery and uh, began talking to him a lot and had some really pivotal, there were some pivotal moments in my recovery that we shared. I met Miles uh, when he was in treatment. I saw him around a few times and he was always kind of a shy guy, didn't really say a whole lot. And then, uh, just through friends, he, he started talking to me, and then uh, he reached out and called me, and, and uh, you know, an unexpected friendship was developed throughout it. Oh man, Miles will, Miles will take the shirt off his back for you if, if you needed it, he really would. I've, I've watched him in the process, he's always really cared more about you than himself. Um, and uh, and I, I, I respect that a lot. He's a living testament of, of recovery. I mean, he, he truly shows how, how to live spiritual principles and how to practice humility and honesty and open-mindedness and, and any sort of thing to selfless act, he will do it. You know, and he cares genuinely about the world and, and how he can make it a better place. I, I, I can't imagine being where I am today without his guidance and his friendship and love that he's had for me. One of my first great experiences with Baker was, I had this issue with love, what love was. I didn't really know, I, you know, I love my mother, my dad, my, you know, my family, but I just, I've had such a warped sense of what love was. But one, one day, Baker and I were talking and, um, and he said, well, I gotta go. And he hugged me and he said, I love you, buddy. And there was something that just clicked, and I don't know what it was, I still can't explain it. For the first time, probably in my life, I understood what love was. And I think Baker exemplifies what love is on a daily basis, and it changed my life. I love you, man. Keep doing what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the difference between me today and two years ago is that there's serenity and peace in my life. I actually have some joy that I've never had before. And I'm able to laugh. I find myself laughing more than I used to. And that's pretty cool. I'm grateful today to be a recovering addict. Very grateful. I'm Miles of East Nashville. I have one year clean. We do recover. <laughs>